judges, former judges, magistrates, tribunal members, legal practitioners, members of the academy, and friends. My task is to introduce Chief Justice Kiefel, who will deliver this year's Supreme Court oration. We have a full house with two overflow courts, in addition to many apologies. I'm going to confine mention of those, because there are a number, to the apology of His Excellency the Governor, who is travelling overseas with Mrs De Jersey, the Attorney General, Ms Darth, and retired High Court Justice Michael Kirby. Now, I'm going to keep this introduction to a minimum for three reasons. Firstly, I suspect that after the last couple of months, Chief Justice Kiefel may have grown a little weary of hearing her accomplishments recounted. Secondly, her honour is before a hometown crowd, so I would think you're all pretty familiar with them. And thirdly, if I were to start detailing them, she'd be left with about five minutes for the oration, and that would be counterproductive. So I'll simply mention, given that Her Honour is speaking on judicial method, that she has had abundant opportunity to observe and practice her subject matter in both the 20th and 21st centuries. It's over 40 years since she was admitted as a barrister, 30 since she took silk, a little over two decades ago, she served, all too briefly, as a member of this court, before moving to the federal court, where she was also appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court of Norfolk Island. And for the last decade, she's been a judge of the High Court. And now, of course, she's our 13th Chief Justice. You know that there is an extraordinary array of achievements and firsts along her road to this point. And very importantly, those of you who've heard her speak before will know that she is a profound thinker about legal issues and an excellent speaker. This ovation, uh, oh, sorry, this oration <laughs> is the seventh in a series of lectures, all of which have been delivered by remarkable and distinguished orators. It goes without saying that we're very fortunate to have her honour continue that tradition. But more, we're also just delighted to have somebody of whom we're all extremely proud back home among friends to deliver this oration tonight. Chief Justice. Thank you, Chief Justice. Colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, this topic, judicial methods in the 21st century, was suggested by Justice Glenn Martin. He observed that the High Court appears to deliver its judgments more quickly than in the past. He asked, could it be that the method of producing judgments has changed? He asked, um, I, I will discuss the processes presently um, utilised in the High Court and, where possible, compare them with what may have occurred in the past. I think it true to say that, in the latter part of the 20th century, public sentiment changed from an acceptance of the truth expressed in the aphorism, justice delayed is justice denied, to an expectation that decisions in litigation should be given reasonably promptly. Courts responded by establishing protocols for the timely delivery of judgments and methods of monitoring delay. In the High Court, for example, a list of outstanding judgments is circulated each Monday. It identifies who has and has not produced a judgment in each outstanding matter. It would have been useful to have had a proper survey of the time taken for the delivery of judgments in the court in the past but this was not possible. The current position may, however, be stated with certainty. Chief Justice French said in the court's 2015-2016 annual report that all civil and criminal appeals decided by the full court in that year were decided within six months of the hearing of argument. I'm prepared to hazard a guess that such a statement is unlikely to have been made at very many points in the court's history. 
The process leading to the production of a judgment now starts at the point of preparation for a hearing. Gone are the days when a justice entered the courtroom unencumbered by any real knowledge of the party's argument. Comprehensive written submissions filed before the hearing have been required since 1997. They have altered things, possibly irretrievably. Preparation may involve not just an understanding of the shape and content of the arguments and where issue is joined, but also an understanding of relevant legislation and key cases. The level of preparation will obviously vary according to the nature of the case, the time allowed for it, and the individual justice. Lord Newberger, the President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, divides judges into two categories judicial pre-Raphaelites, who read everything, and judicial impressionists, who read very little. He frankly admitted to being more of an impressionist. This was later reported in a newspaper article entitled, Lord Newberger, Britain's most senior judge, admits he doesn't read all the papers, or words to that effect. I think most High Court justices would prepare as much as time allows and as much as they consider necessary to the particular case. Much depends on how up-to-date one is with judgments and where one draws the line between continuing to write them and preparing for the next sittings. Preparation enables better engagement with the argument during the hearing and it shortens the time taken for the hearing. A glance at the Commonwealth law reports for the number of hearing days in comparable matters in the past confirms this. A justice is also better placed to start writing the judgment than before. Writing can commence soon after the conclusion of oral argument and the conference which follows it. In recent years, the High Court has adopted the practice of holding a short meeting of the justices at the beginning of each sitting week, preparatory to hearings. Pre-hearing meetings are not uncommon in other common law jurisdictions. Their principal purpose is to identify any procedural issues or matters to which the party's attention needs to be directed before the hearing. Points of possible importance might be flagged. Sometimes preliminary views are offered, but any substantial discussion is left until the meeting which is held after the conclusion of oral argument. Methods of conferring differ between jurisdictions. In England, the post-hearing meeting um, involves the practice that the judges speak in inverse order of seniority, with the most junior offering his or her view first. This tradition was apparently designed to, quote, forestall any tendencies of more junior law lords to be overly deferential to more senior and more transient colleagues. Needless to say, the position in Australia today is rather more informal. It suggests little concern about the possibility of deference. There is a free exchange of views in no particular order, with the Chief Justice or the, Chief, the Justice who has presided steering the meeting. There is opportunity for persuasion, for criticism and debate. The benefits of the conference should be obvious. Each justice has the benefit of the views of six legal minds, which should be amongst the best in Australia. Why would one not listen to them? Even if one does not agree with another point of view, discussion can only assist in refining one's own. The final product is bound to be better. But it is not at all clear that conferences, or conferences of this kind, have been a fixture in the past. This may in part be explained by the justices not being in a position to have formed views to enable discussion because they did not have written submissions and had not prepared for the hearing. It may also be explicable by reference to attitudes to such meetings. Another purpose of the conference is to ascertain if there is a clear majority. This does not involve voting as it does in some courts, such as the US Supreme Court, their judges speak in descending order of seniority and then vote. Curiously, this is not dissimilar to the process undertaken in some civilian jurisdictions. 
the main difference between the two being that civilian courts aim for one collective decision, the US Supreme Court for two, one majority and one dissenting judgment. There is rarely more than one meeting held post-hearing, largely because once the process of writing a judgment commences, views tend to become quickly entrenched. There is much to be said for a further meeting when the first ends inconclusively as to a majority view, or where the justices need more time to reach their conclusions. It can be useful for them to give the matter some further thought, to work towards a solution, and then exchange memos before a further meeting is held. If there is a clear majority at the end of the meeting, one justice is usually assigned the task of producing a first draft for the others. The allocation may be made on the basis of the issues in the matter being of particular interest to a justice or simply in order to achieve an equitable allocation of work. A system like this works best if all are able to produce judgments to a similar standard and within a similar time. If there is not a clear majority, sometimes a justice nevertheless volunteers, perhaps hoping to bring his or her colleagues to a point of view. But sometimes judges need to work their way through the problem and writing a judgment is the only way to do it. In this event, no allocation is made, but there may be informed discussions later, exchanging views and identifying who is writing. In either case, those who are not assigned a first draft will usually make further detailed notes after the meeting. They may have further research undertaken and themselves prepare an outline or even a draft of their own in preparation for the receipt of the first draft. The principal purpose of a first draft is to have those who are of the same view agree with it and thus avoid unnecessary judgments. By unnecessary, I mean judgments without, which add nothing of substance to what has already been written. A judgment of this kind is unnecessary for the justice writing it. It is unnecessary for the court and for those who read the published judgments. This is not to suggest that there may not be perfectly valid reasons why another justice may find it necessary to write. I shall discuss them later. But even if that be so, a first draft is a valuable resource. It should not be necessary for another justice to set out the facts again, at least not completely. The first draft will also identify the relevant legislative provisions and place them in context, identify the party's arguments and discuss the authorities which bear upon the issues. This is why the reader often sees a grateful acknowledgement of another's labours in a later judgment. There is also a method to writing first drafts. They need to be succinct. A long judgment which says more than is necessary is much less likely to attract agreement. Neither will a judgment written in the idiosyncratic style of the author or in florid language uh, with quotes from the classics or 19th century literature. It is better to resist the temptation to quote extensively from them unless the aim is not to have others join in at all. With respect to both the layout and the length of a judgment, the modern judgment is different from those of the past. A survey has recently been undertaken of the length of judgments of the High Court in the period from 1903 to 2015. The authors refer to judgments collectively rather than individually. They found, amongst other things, that the length of judgments was relatively stable during the first five or six decades of the court. That ended in the 1970s when a general expansive trend followed, which resulted in the Brennan and Gleeson courts producing the lengthiest judgments in the court's history. Two observations might be made about those periods. In the first place, there appear to have been many more individual judgments, some of substantial length. And for a significant part of both periods, 
a lengthy dissent appears in almost every case. It is said that at the event which marked the publication of volume 200 of the CLRs, a former justice of the court remarked to the author of those dissents that had it not been for them, the celebration would have not taken place for many years. <laughs> it's a pity that Justice Kirby was unable to be here tonight. <laughs> Some things have clearly changed in relation to the way judgments are written, not the least because writing styles have changed. We no longer write sentences which travel across many pages. We have full stops, paragraphs, and even headings. One can have too much of a good thing. Lord Bingham, speaking extrajudicially, once said that his heart sank whenever he had to embark upon reading a judgment that set out a table of content or chapters. That may be so, but I think that most would agree that this method is helpful when judgments are lengthy. The real question is whether the judgments need to be so long. I have always assumed it to be a universally held view that a judgment should be as succinctly stated as the matter allows. That assumption may not be correct. A concern has been expressed by the President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal that the judgments of the High Court are too short. They do not deal with the subject at length and in as much detail as the intermediate appellate court from which the appeal is brought. Rarely does the High Court need to review facts. It has the benefit of the findings of the courts below. This may sometimes account for the length of the judgments of those courts. Lengthy dissertations of the law are another matter. It is, I suggest, a question for any appellate court, the High Court included, whether that is necessary in each case. A first draft judgment is circulated to the other judges in order to ascertain if those of like view will agree with it. Agreement is expressed by the circulation of a judgment which states little, if anything more, than the fact of agreement with the reasons and the orders proposed. That justice is then usually joined in to the first draft with his or her consent. The justice's name then appears on the judgment with that of the author. If others agree, they too are joined in. Although judgments are called the judgment of the court when all justices agree, or joint judgments, or more controversially, judgments of the plurality when a number agree, it is more often the case that there is only one author. Whilst it is not unusual for suggestions, sometimes substantial in content, to be made to the author of the first draft, it is not often the case that two or more justices will work together to produce a judgment. It is difficult to do so. Suggested changes to the first draft after its circulation are usually contained in a memorandum in which an explanation is given for the changes. It would not be usual to suggest a change in its essential reasoning or a substantial rewriting of it all those suggestions may nevertheless be of significance. The author of the first draft is not obliged to accept any proposed changes. The effect of the High Court's practice of joining in other judges is to render the author largely anonymous. It is not a practice uh, adopted by many other courts in common law jurisdictions. Some might argue that a reader should know who the author is, although it is difficult to see what the benefit of that knowledge could be. On occasions, a justice might wish the practice was otherwise, particularly when it is felt that he or she has written a very good judgment. But it is always understood that if the practice were not followed, justices would be encouraged to write separately more often which is what the practice seeks to avoid. Even when agreeing, some judges cannot help but say more. 
a judgment in a criminal law case before the House of Lords reported in 1999 furnishes an example. The law lord in question explained that he had been persuaded to concur with the reasons of a colleague because trial judges needed certainty in the particular area of the law. He nevertheless took one and a half pages of the law reports to summarise the reasons he was abandoning. A judge is at liberty to write separately to the same result if he or she chooses. There may, as I have said, be perfectly valid reasons for a judge doing so. There may be something which is considered necessary to be added to what has been written, which could not be accommodated within the first draft. An important qualification might be, might be thought necessary. A judge may not consider that the judgment has been expressed clearly enough, or it might be written in a style which they do not wish to be seen to adopt. It may contain statements of principle, or even a footnote which a judge does not wish to be taken to approve, but which the author has declined to remove. It goes without saying that if a judge cannot agree with the view of the majority, he or she is duty bound to dissent and to write accordingly. I would expect that any judge who is considering this course will first have endeavoured to understand the majority view and whether they can accept it as a possible view. Not the least because if a number of one's colleagues are persuaded to a point of view, it could just be that one is wrong. Most justices are motivated to agree with a first draft written by another if they are of the same view, the reasoning is correct, and there is no other obstacle to agreement. They will agree although they may have wished to write themselves. They may even think they might have expressed it somewhat better than their colleague. But they appreciate that there is every good reason to reduce the number of individual judgments which are published in a matter. In the first place, foregoing writing another judgment to the same effect allows each like-minded justice to focus their attention on other judgments. If all or most of the judges adopt this approach, there will be a reduction in the time taken to publish judgments. On the other hand, if all or most of them are writing in most matters, there will almost certainly be delays. There will be delays because justices will have a backlog of judgments. A single majority judgment is also more likely to provide a clearer ratio. The reader will not be required to analyse a number of judgments in order to ascertain if, if there is a ratio and whether the reasoning in each judgment accords with the others. Readers include judges of lower courts who must apply the court's reasons and practitioners. These judges often work under considerable pressure of time. A practitioner's time in reading at length is a cost, sometimes a considerable cost, to their client. The Supreme Court of the United Kingdom appears recently to have attempted to reduce the number of individual judgments. Lord Newberger calls judgments which add nothing to what has already been written by a colleague and effectively say no more to the reader than, I have understood this case, or I think I can express it better, vanity judgments. He says that they are at best a waste of time and space, and at worst confusion and uncertainty, although they are popular with academics. He adds that most appellate court judges have been guilty of writing them at some time. A single judgment of the court or of the majority carries greater authority, not only for its precedential value. It instills confidence in the court's decision. This is especially important where it's necessary to give guidance to courts below. So understood, some of the benefits of a single judgment, or at least fewer individual judgments, are institutional. The vanity judgment, 
of which Lord Newberger speaks, is not the voice of the court, it is the sound of self. There are critics of this collegiate approach, including a former justice of the High Court. They argue that conferences and agreement with another's judgment compromise the independence of judges. According to this view, a judge has a duty to reveal what he or she thinks to the parties and to the public, and it is necessary that each judge show that the case has been given the closest personal attention. These obligations are fulfilled, it is said, by avoiding discourse with other judges and writing separately in each case. These views may be answered shortly. The opinion of a judge is revealed to the world by the publication of a judgment in his or her name. A judgment written for the purpose of proving that a judge has understood the case is an unnecessary judgment of the kind earlier referred to. It is no part of the duty of a judge to write a judgment in every case. The true duty of a judge is to consider a matter properly before coming to a decision. The fulfilment of that duty is a matter of conscience for a judge. The method by which a judge's opinion is expressed is irrelevant to it. No appellate judge in Australia would conceive of a judge's duty as being simply to vote on a matter. But as any judge who has ever concurred in another's judgment knows, it is not necessary to write a judgment to be able to reason to a conclusion. The collegiate method enables a judge not only to give proper consideration to a matter, but to do so promptly. This is because, as earlier explained, it involves preparation, participation at hearing and in conference, and making notes and outlines. The individualist, writing in each matter, will rarely be in this position. The other concern which is expressed about the collegiate approach is the effect of, quote, excessively dominant judicial personalities. I think most people would be surprised at the suggestion that High Court justices might be overcome by such a personality. I have had no experience of such a person. It is not clear whether those who are concerned about judges' conferences have. The examples given are drawn from the English judiciary of the past, such as Lord Diplock. This might not be thought to provide a strong reason for declining to engage in a dialogue with one's colleagues. The ability to influence is another thing altogether. It is a fact that some people, judges and lawyers included, are better at persuasion than others. There are methods which may be employed by judges to persuade their colleagues. Participating in discussion is one. Preparation for it is another. Writing a judgment quickly when a first draft has not been assigned is sometimes effective, although it may be overcome simply by advising one's colleagues that you will pr be producing another judgment for their consideration. Lord Newberger, in response to the criticism of the collegiate approach, identifies another obligation to which a judge is subject. It is, quote, to do her best to ensure that the court of which she is a member produces as clear and coherent a judgment or set of judgments as is consistent with each member's opinion. I respectfully agree. The individualistic approach has not been without its critics. In 1984, Professor A.W.B. Simpson wrote, quote, the undisciplined individualism of English appellate judges and their complete lack of colleg any collegiate spirit reduces much of their work to mere confusion. Lack of coherence and clarity in the court's reasoning is one undesirable result of too many separate judgments. Delay is another. 
the reality is that the timely production of judgments could not be achieved if each judge's justice produced a completely separate judgment in each case. The critics of the collegiate approach do not suggest otherwise. Indeed, they do not point to any benefit that might accrue to the court or to those affected by its judgments from the pursuit of individualism. A delay in publication of judgments may have important consequences for litigants and for the court. Some years ago, I wrote a joint judgment with two colleagues. It was joint in the true sense. Each of us wrote a separate part of it. It was to be an important judgment involving commercial law. I would give the citation for the judgment, but it was never published. Our joint judgment was circulated. All but one concurred. We waited for that justice's judgment, but the justice had a backlog of judgments. The parties waited for the court's decision. Months passed. Finally, the other judgment arrived. We gave notice that we would hand down the court's decision in a week's time. A few days before that date, the parties advised the court that the matter had been settled. It is not difficult to infer that, as time went on, the parties decided to resolve it for themselves, and the court had let them down. One solution to the pressure of time might be for individual justices to write judgments by the method adopted by judges of the US Supreme Court, which is, of course, to delegate that task to his or her clerk. I had thought that great individualist, Antonin Scalia, to have been an exception to this practice. However, in an interview conducted a few years before his death, the judge frankly admitted that he had never written a first draft of his own judgments. I hasten to add there is no suggestion that this practice might become part of the judicial method of the High Court, at least not at, at present. In conclusion, the answer to Justice Martin's question is that a somewhat different judicial method does appear to have evolved. It started with the introduction of written submissions. The work of a justice shifted from post to pre-hearing. There came to be closer engagement with oral argument and with colleagues in discussions. Judgments are now produced in which a majority combine in agreement. One cannot say that this method is here to stay. Much will depend upon the continued acceptance of the benefits it produces. Views can change and with them judicial methods. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, my role is, of course, unnecessary, uh, but it is to move a vote of thanks uh, to the Chief Justice. We have been treated uh, to an illuminating and intellectual analysis of the way that judgments uh, are and have been produced in the High Court uh, with comparative references and, fortunately, occasional glimpses behind the scenes of the High Court uh, and, if I may so, say so, with some glimpses of humour which refer to some particular judges, although subtly and appropriately. Um, I have two roles. One is to move the vote of thanks uh, and one is to give a gift to the Chief Justice. First, can I ask you all please again to record your thanks in the usual way. And secondly, uh, a small token of our esteem. Thank, Thank you, Chief you Justice. And now I invite you all uh, to have refreshments in the area outside this court. And may I also add 
that if you are looking uh, for something to occupy St Patrick's Day or for a Christmas stocking, you will find a free copies, I think they're free, of the Library's 2015 annual yearbook outside. Thank you. <laughs>